Hey, well, this has uh, been a great week, yeah? Great week. And uh, it's, it's been my great joy to be here with you and to uh, take some time to share together in God's Word. It's been really uplifting for me to see you guys just pour yourself out in worship to God. And here's what I want to say about that. For some of you, that's been easier here because you've been following. But now is the time for you to go back to your churches and lead, right? Because if you go back to your churches and follow, what you'll do is you'll follow, you know, like what you were doing back at your church, which is probably not taking a posture of prayer, praise and worship, of receiving from God. It's been kind of like maybe you just sitting there. But what you've been doing here is something different. You've been engaging, you've been pressing in, you've been seeking God, you've been responding to Him. And I dare say that doesn't happen in the same way every Sunday in your own local church. That's because you've been following. Now is the time to lead. So take what you've learned here, what you've done here, and go back and keep doing it and influence others and, and see a change come. We're going to be in the book of Exodus, but before we do, we're going to pray that ancient prayer that we've been praying every time we've opened God's Word, taking that posture of open hands before God, open heart to receive from Him. So would you probably know it off by heart now? It'll be up on the screen just in case. Would you just, um, if you know it, close your eyes, bow your head, open hands, open heart, and pray with me. Ready? Come, Holy Spirit. Is it there? Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. One more time. Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. And so we want to hear from the Holy Spirit today. Part of His job is to actually make Scripture come alive to us, help us to understand the Word of God. And so we're in um, Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Uh, I'm going to read a big chunk of it to you. Exodus gives us the story of the deliverance from uh, the Israelites from their slavery and bondage in Egypt and their 40-year journey through the desert to the promised land. Exodus chapter 3 is where we're going to be. I'm going to read to you, I think, from uh, verse 1. Yes, through to verse 14. Again, it'll be up on the screen, but it's good to follow along if you're with, in your Bible if you have it. Here we go. This is about Moses. One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why is it that this bush is not burning up? I must go and see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, I, uh, replied Moses. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard the cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I'm aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. I did practice that, that was a bit hard. Verse 9, look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go. For I'm sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God. 
Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you. And this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. But Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me, they will ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now Moses is 80 years old at this point. The story so far is that he was, he was born to Hebrew slaves at a time when it was very dangerous for Hebrew babies to be born because the policy of Egypt was to try to uh, depopulate uh, Egypt of the uh, Israelites, to keep their, their numbers down because they were afraid that if they were too populous, they might overthrow the Egyptians. And so what they, they had this policy of throwing baby boys away into the Nile River. That's how they would keep the population down. Is if, if a Hebrew slave had a baby boy, they would be thrown into the Nile River. Quite barbaric. But Moses' parents had kept him at home and hidden him for three months, and probably until he got a little bit noisy at three months. And after three months, what they did was they put him in this little floating basket and hid him in the Nile River amongst the bulrushes. His older sister, Miriam, uh, would, would stand on the riverbank and uh, just keep watch, keep an eye on him. Until one day, the Pharaoh's daughter found the baby Moses in this basket and she took him home and adopted him as her own son and gave him the name Moses, we read. Now Miriam, being a very smart older sister, she ran after Pharaoh's daughter and said, you're probably going to need a nursemaid to take care of this baby. And she offered to find a nursemaid for Pharaoh's daughter. And her mother, the mother of Moses, was able to actually bring up her own child as the nursemaid in the palace of Pharaoh, probably paid to do so, pretty sweet deal. Moses grew up and uh, in the royal courts as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And uh, at the age of 40, it seems that he knew that he wasn't actual Egyptian royalty, but that he was the child of Hebrew slaves. Somehow he seemed to know that because when he saw the Egyptian slave uh, drivers beating up an Israelite slave, he got angry and he killed the Egyptian. Well, I mean, he knew he'd done the wrong thing, so he hid the body. But as often happens, someone found the body and word was sent to Pharaoh, who then looked for Moses. Someone told him Moses had done this. So Moses fled from Egypt, fearing for his life. And he went out into the Midian desert, found a job with some girls who were looking after their father's sheep. He married one of them and then spent the next 40 years living in the Midian Desert. So that happened when he was 40. 40 years later, he's still tending sheep in the Midian Desert, which makes him... Oh, someone passed maths. 80. So, one day, after 40 years of this, after 40 years of looking after sheep, 80 years old, he saw something a little unusual off in the distance in the desert. A, a, a bush had kind of burst into flame. Now, I mean, that's, that is a little bit unusual. I, I mean, I guess it was hot and dry, and maybe somehow it burst into flame. So he kind of thought it was unusual, but kept an eye on it. it normally, if a bush was on fire, it would kind of eventually burn itself out, and there'd be nothing left but a pile of ash, right? But this bush kept burning, kept burning. Uh, and so Moses kind of he looked at it again and kept an eye on it. He looked again later, it was still burning. Probably stopped and had lunch. Looked again, it, it's still burning. And he thought to himself, what is going on here? I, I think I should go over and see what this strange thing is. See this strange sight. And as he approached 
the burning bush, God spoke to him from within the burning bush. Now, Moses didn't know this was God at, the, at that moment. Initially, he wondered why this thing wasn't burning itself out. But he knew something unusual was happening, so he went to investigate. And there will be times when you see God at work, perhaps in someone's life. And if you are wise, if you see with spiritual eyes, you may ask the same questions as Moses. What is going on there? Maybe I should go and see what's happening. What's happening here? What is this unusual thing that is t taking place in this person's life? You know, the people who have impacted me the most have been the people whose lives have caused me to wonder what's going on in this person's life. How is it that they live like that? Well, whatever it is, it's, it's not normal. It's not usual. And, and the more I've looked, the, the closer I've looked, I've discovered that it's God at work in them. God at work through them. And, and we ought to live our lives like that too. Lives that make other people question, what is going on in that person? What, why are they like that? What, why, how can they be so loving, so forgiving, so generous? How, how can they be so joyful despite what's happening around them? Well, Moses went to inquire, as we ought to, when we see that in a person's life. He went to see what was going on, why this bush wasn't burning up. And when he did, God spoke to him. He said, Moses, God knew his name. And God knows your name. And God will speak to you in the same way that he spoke to Moses. Moses responded, here I am. Great response, by the way, when God calls your name. And notice the first thing that God says to Moses. The first thing that God says to Moses after that is take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. Take off your shoes, because this is holy ground. And you think God would have more important things to talk to Moses about than his shoes? I mean, is this a question of etiquette? I mean, when you talk to God, you take your shoes off? Is that, is that the, the right etiquette with God? I mean, I know there are some Eastern customs uh, where, you know, before you enter a house, you take your shoes off. Um, some Asian uh, customs related to footwear and shoes and the soles of your feet where it's quite offensive. Uh, even Indian, uh, where it's offensive to uh, point the sole of your foot at someone. I almost got uh, kicked off a plane mid-air for doing that, accidentally. Ask me about that one day. So was God simply following a custom, take your shoes off? Or is there something more significant going on here? And I want to suggest to you that there is, and we're going to come back to that kind of in a few moments and talk about Moses' shoes but verse 6 says this. Speaking of God, then he said, then God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. I have indeed seen the misery of people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. And so I have come down to rescue them. Down to verse 9, the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Who is God talking about in those verses? Himself. Yeah, there's lots. Eight times. Eight times he says, I. I am the God of your fathers. I have seen the misery of your people. I have heard them cry. I am concerned about their suffering. I have come down. I will bring them into a land. I have seen the way the Egyptians are um, oppressing them. Eight times. I, 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 I. Moses, I'm going to deliver the Israelites because I've seen it. I've heard it. So I will do it. Get the picture? And I imagine Moses at that point gets maybe kind of excited, like this is fantastic news, at last. We've been praying for this for years, that, that, that the, my, my Israelite kin, my family, would be released from slavery, they'd be set free. At last you're going to come down and do something, wonderful. You're going to come to their rescue, you're going to deliver them. So how are you going to do it? Verse 10, now go for I'm sending you. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I thought you said you were going to do it. God says, no, go, I'm sending you. Wait, 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 wait. You said you were going to do it. 
You said you've seen their misery. You've heard our cry. You're coming to rescue us. You said you were going to do this. So why are you sending me? Now, it is absolutely true that the only explanation for what takes place and for how the people of Israel are eventually set free is that God did it, that he was going to do it and that he did it. That's the only explanation. Moses didn't send the 10 plagues or part the, the sea. But God's way of doing things is through people. Through you and me. And so he sends people. God's strategy in this world is people. It's us. If you're a Christian, God's strategy for drawing you into his family, to himself, was through another person. Maybe you saw someone's life that was different, unusual, unexplainable, uh, like, like the burning bush, and you're intrigued by it. Maybe you heard someone preach the gospel and through it God spoke to you and you responded by trusting in Jesus. It could be any number of ways, but you can, you can be sure that somewhere along the way, somewhere along the line, another human being was involved in that process because God's means, His means of working in the world is through people. That's why so often you hear about, you read about in Scripture, you read about God looking for a person, looking for someone. Let me give you some examples. In Ezekiel 22, 30, God speaking, He says, I looked for someone among them who would build up a wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land. He was looking for someone to do His work. 2 Chronicles 16, 9, The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. What's He looking for? He's looking for a man or a woman who will let God show Himself strong in them. He's not looking for strong people who will be strong for God, but people who will let God show himself strong in them and through them. You see the difference? God's strategy for reaching the world is us. It's only going to happen as he finds people who are willing, obedient, dependent upon him and available to him. See, God doesn't send angels to evangelize your neighbors. I mean, he could, he's got a lot of angels, and it'd be kind of cool to see an angel turn up to your next door neighbor's place. But angels are not his method for reaching people. There are other ways that God could do it. He could just turn up himself. I mean, he did that once. But he has chosen to work through people, through us. So Moses, yep, yeah, it's absolutely true that the only explanation for the deliverance of Israel from Egypt is that God will do it, that he will do it. And God says, but I'm sending you because you are the means, you are the strategy, you are the way I'm going to do it. And I wonder if the reason why God said, take off your shoes is because it's God who will be responsible for what, happen, what happens. He's going to do it, and he'll do it in your shoes. He'll do it in your shoes. Verse 5, take off your sandals, take off your shoes, for you are standing on holy ground. Now, the word holy, holy means to be set apart. It means to be set apart for God. God says, Moses, I'm sending you on this mission, and every place where you set your foot will be holy ground, set apart for God, because I'm going to go, I'm going to do it in your shoes. God says, I'm with you. Isaiah 52 verse 7 says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Why feet? I mean, wouldn't it make sense to say how beautiful is the mouth of the one who brings good news? Or even how beautiful the mind is the one who brings good news. Or, or how beautiful is the heart of the person who brings good news. Why does it say feet? How beautiful on the mountain are the feet of those who bring good news. It's because God, it's because before God is interested in your ability, He's interested in your availability. Before He's interested in your ability, He's far more interested in your availability. Are you prepared to go where he says go? Well, that means take off your shoes before God. 
You're standing on holy ground. Let him step into them because it's his work. He's going to do it. He's the one who's calling you. Moses responds to God's call by saying, who am I? Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to do this, to, to, to lead the people um, of Israel out of Egypt? And then he follows up with this long list of excuses. I'm too old. I'm a failure. I'm a refugee. I'm a foreigner. I, I'm, I'm not good at speaking. And we might add a whole lot of, lot of other excuses to that list. I'm too young. I've messed my life up. Uh, I don't know enough yet. God didn't pay any attention to all of that. You know what God did when Moses made these excuses? He totally ignored them. He ignored Moses' excuses. Every one. This is how he responds. Verse 12, he says, I will be with you. That's God's response to Moses, to his complaints, to his, his uh, excuses. I will be with you. I'll be right there walking with you in those shoes, those sandals you took off. See, Moses was forgetting something. God says, you're forgetting Moses. I am sending you. I'm asking you to take your shoes off to surrender your feet to me because I'm going to go with you. I'm going to do it. I'm sending you. I want your availability. I will be with you. It will be God in Moses' shoes. Moses is not being invited to go and work for God hear this, because it applies to us too. Moses is not being invited to go and work for God, but to work with God, where God will be working through him. Not for God, but with God, allowing God to work through him. You see, before God is interested in our ability, he's interested in our availability. Can I have your shoes, Moses? Are you available? Will you go where I ask you to go? Will you do what I ask you to do? And so the logical question then is, if you are going to be with me, well, who actually are you? Who are you, he says to Moses, to God essentially. Now, he didn't quite say it as bluntly as that. He used the old trick, right? The old trick where um, in verse 13 and 14, he says, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of our ancestors, because that's how much he knew, you know, God of Isaac, Jacob, God of our ancestors has sent me to them. They will ask me, what's his name? So what should I tell them? You know, this sounds like the old, you know, like asking a question on behalf of a friend. Like I've got this friend who was just wondering, you know, if the Israelites ask your name, what should I tell them? Verse 14, God replies to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, that doesn't sound like a very helpful answer, does it? What's your name? Rob. Oh, that's a little bit more helpful than what's your name? Ah, oh, the guy who came up from Brisbane. I'm that guy. It's kind of like what God says there. But actually, it's a great answer. It's a great answer when you think about it. It's a great answer when you look into it, uh, when you understand. See, God didn't say, my name is I was at the burning bush. Remember this moment remember your call it's going to sustain you as you go through this life of ministry remember this point remember your commissioning that'll keep you going no no he didn't say I was he didn't say that he didn't say I will be I'll be in the land of Canaan on the other side of the Jordan when you finally get there keep your vision where you know where you're headed where you're going I'll I'll be there that's my name I will he didn't say that he said I am I am at any time, in any situation, in any crisis, when your back is against the wall, I am. I'm totally sufficient for all of your needs, everything that you need, everything that you want. Always with you. The answer to every question, the healer of your soul, I am. God's name is I am. Not, not I was, not I will be. I am. He is, present tense, always enough, sufficient for you, always able. And so the big question you need to ask Moses is, are you... It is not, are you, Moses, up to the task? The big question you need to ask is, am I God? Am I up to the task? Do you believe that I'm enough, God is saying? And so, campus, I'm asking you today, do you believe God is enough to go with you, to sustain you? Is he able to help you through every situation that you face in your life? 
Have you given your shoes to God? Because when your feet belong to God, He will put you in the right place at the right time for the right purpose. And so as we close this afternoon, I wonder where God is calling you. God called Moses, gave him a task. He took his shoes off because he was standing on holy ground. And in a sense showed his availability. Yes, there were questions. Yes, there were concerns. Yes, there was some pushback with some excuses. But ultimately, he surrendered to God and said, yes, I will go. My feet are yours. Walk with me in my shoes. Let's go do this thing together. And so I wonder where God is calling you to go. I wonder what God is calling you to do. You might be in in the very early process of working that out, and that's okay. You don't need to be able to answer that question. But you might also be right in the middle of uh, arguing with God like Moses did, making excuses about why you can't do that thing that he's asking you to do or calling you to do. Maybe he's calling you to do something really specific that's a bit more immediate, like befriending someone who doesn't yet know Jesus. Maybe that's what he's calling you to. Maybe he's calling you to something more career path oriented, like to be a missionary or to be a pastor or to be a church planter or to be part of a church planting team that launches out to extend the kingdom in a new place, in a new way. Maybe he's calling you to serve in your local church, on the worship team, or in the Sunday school, or on the uh, greeter at the door, or making coffee. Maybe he's calling you to study, whether that's ministry study, like Kingsley College, that some of you will get to hear about this afternoon, or some other area, because here's the thing, we need committed Christian teachers. We need committed Christian lawyers, especially. We need (laughs) committed Christian counselors, and nurses, and tradies. We, we need committed Christians across the whole gamut of the workplace. But we also need Christian leaders in the church. We need pastors. We need missionaries. We need church planters. And we need those who will serve alongside of them. So what is it that God is laying on your heart? How does he want to use you with a unique makeup and gift set that is just you? Your humor and your way of thinking about the world, and your strengths and gifts. He knows them all. It's part of what it means when we say God knows your name. Because in the Old Testament, your name actually described a lot about you. It's like when someone says, oh, you're a haksma. You're saying, oh, I I know your family. I I know who your people are. I know a bit about you. When God says, Moses... I'm the God of your fathers. He's revealing who he is. And he knows who you are. And so what is God laying on your heart? How is he wanting to use you? Don't be afraid. Don't make excuses. Just take off your shoes and say, yes, Lord, here I am. Here are my shoes. Here are my feet. I'm standing here. My shoes are yours on holy ground because I'm in your presence and I'm declaring that I am available, ready and willing to serve, to go, to do what you call me to do, whatever you say, because I know you'll be with me and I know that you'll be at work in and through me. Now, campus, this is a holy moment because we started out praying, Holy Spirit, come. We've opened up the Holy Word of God and God is here by His Holy Spirit. This is a holy moment. And as a way of responding to the call of God on your life and maybe, maybe you're not ready for this and that's okay, but some, some I pray will be. As a way of responding to the call of God on your life this afternoon. I'm going to ask you to do something a bit different, a bit weird, but then that's what God did with Moses, right? I'm actually going to ask you to do the same thing. To take off your shoes as your way of responding when you're ready to say, yes, Lord. Yes, I will go. Yes, I will be available. My feet are available to you. Send me where you will. Be careful. He might send you somewhere unexpected. 
You can keep your socks on. <laughs> and so before you get too carried away with this, slow down. Know what you're saying yes to. If God has been speaking to you, if he's been drawing you into his service, we're going to have a quiet moment of prayer. And if God has spoken to you over the course of these last few days, I'm literally giving you the opportunity to take off your shoes, to stand barefooted on this holy ground, maybe in socks, on this holy carpet. And I'm going to pray for those of you who do. In this holy moment with our holy God, God is calling you to surrender to a life of serving him, give him your shoes and make your feet available to him. Let me pray for you. We're not done yet. God, this is a holy moment. And like Moses, we are here in your presence and you know our name. We've been listening to your voice. You call us all into your family. You call some of us to serve you in a whole range of different ways. And particularly now, I'm talking about some of those career pathways. And if when I say pastor or missionary or church planter or church planting team member, or leader in the church, if your heart beats harder, if your heart pounds harder, faster, when you think about that, perhaps that is an indication that God is calling you to that. So if you're willing to stand and say, God, I give you my feet, my ability and my availability, and so wherever you send me, I will go, Whatever you call me, I will serve. It might be a pastor in a church loving God's people and teaching them about Jesus. It might be to travel overseas and be a missionary and bring the gospel to other people groups. It might be a church planter starting a new work in a new community. Wherever he's calling you to, I'm taking my shoes off, standing before you like Moses the ground on which I stand is holy ground. My life is set apart for you. I will go where you say, I will do what you call me to do. If that's your prayer right now, take your shoes off and stand on this holy ground. And respond to what God is calling you to. Because God is here and he is speaking and he knows your heart. And he can speak right into you. He knows your future. He knows how he's wired you. He knows how he's gifted you. He knows the people who need to hear your testimony. He knows the way that you will respond as a leader in his church. He knows how you're wired to do church, maybe differently to the way church has always been done. To start something new. Maybe you have that apostolic kind of gift to go and initiate new things, new churches, new ways of doing church. Maybe you've got that kind of more prophetic gift where you, you, you'll stand up and declare that, that this is a new day for the Lord, a new day for the church. And call others around you, your peers, young people, to follow God and to serve Him with all of their lives. God, we stand before you now. We're standing on holy ground in this holy moment because you are here by your Holy Spirit. And we say, use us. Would you use us? Would you use this generation of people? I mean, you've been using me for a long time and I'm grateful for that. And I, I, I see standing before me this whole new generation of those who are willing to serve you, God. Lord, would you not let them turn to the right or the left, but, but walk in their shoes with them, that they would stay on your path, that they would continue to serve you, that they would go the hard yards. It wasn't easy for Moses. It's not easy to pack up and move to another country to learn another language so you can be a missionary and see people not wanting to respond to you perhaps for many years. It's not easy to have to study to be a pastor and go through that kind of time of not having much money to pay the bills and maybe not see a lot of 
uh, response in people's lives, struggle in a, low, a small church that might not be able to pay you. These things are not easy, but if God calls you to them, you need to know that He will do it. He says, I have seen the plight of my people. He knows the need of Australia. He knows the need of your neighborhood. He knows the needs in your life. And He says, I will do it, but I'm going to do it through you. Today, God, we give ourselves to you. Those who are standing here, God, I pray that you give them a vision for who you are and what you're calling them to. God, would you be the God of their every moment, of their every now. You are the great I am. And so, Lord, whatever they face, wherever they find themselves, wherever you call them to, we know you will go with them. And whatever the task is, you will do it in and through them. And we believe that, we declare it, we work towards that, trusting in you, in faith, offering ourselves into your service. God, would you do something spectacular with this generation and turn this country around. God, I'm praying that I might see revival uh, in my days through this generation, that people would come to know you en masse, that there would be a turning away from the secular, turning away from the self-satisfaction um, that life seems to be about for, for this whole country, and that there would be a turning to you, Jesus, as young men and women like these here to, to today fully live out serving you in their lives, fully living out what it means for you to be at work in and through them, fully trusting in you and fully meaning every bit of what they're standing here today for, saying, yes, I will go. My feet are yours. Send them where you want me to go and I will do it. Today, we're making that decision. We are yours. We are your people. You're our God. Do with us as you will. And would you be honored and glorified in our lives? We pray in Jesus' name. We're going to continue worshiping him now. Thank you for joining me barefooted before our great God and King. He's so worthy. Let's sing, sing to him now. We're